Puyallup, Washington lies approximately 10 miles southeast of Tacoma and 35 miles to the south of Seattle. Situated in the lush landscape of the Pacific Northwest, the city embodies a charming blend of small town warmth and urban convenience. Nestled amidst rolling hills and the flowing Puyallup River, Puyallup boasts a rich tapestry of history and culture. The Ezra Meeker Mansion, an Italian Victorian structure which was finished around 1890 and served as the residence of Oregon Trail pioneer Ezra Meeker and his wife Eliza Jane, presently serves as a museum and is a popular attraction in the area. The city's roots trace back to the indigenous Puyallup people, whose name signifies generous people. With the advent of the Northern Pacific Railway in the late 19th century, Puyallup burgeoned into a bustling centre for agriculture and commerce. In the past, Puyallup gained recognition for its cultivation of hops, berries and flowers. Presently, numerous events such as the Washington State Fair, the Daffodil Festival and Parade and the Puyallup Farmers Market commemorate the city's agricultural heritage. Puyallup's welcoming atmosphere and scenic surroundings make it a cherished gem in the heart of Washington State. In 2001, Puyallup was home to 36-year-old Dana Laskowski, a recently separated mother to eight-year-old triplets. She worked as a nanny and taught children sign language. She was described by loved ones as an outgoing, popular individual who prioritised others' needs before her own. She was a patient and understanding individual who opened her heart to not only her family and friends, but also strangers, displaying a profoundly maternal and nurturing demeanour. An example of this is that Dana would often provide refuge for her 17-year-old niece, Amanda, who had a tendency to run away from home in an effort to steer her away from trouble. Dana was born on the 23rd of February 1965 to award-winning architectural artist Bill Ross and his wife Judy, and she grew up in Puyallup. Like her father, she possessed considerable artistic talent, albeit viewing it more as a hobby, as her aspirations leaned towards establishing her own daycare. She had a happy childhood and loved life. She yearned to have a family of her own, and this dream was one step closer to becoming a reality after meeting Sam Laskowski in 1989. The couple went on to get married and tried for many years to have children of their own. They struggled with fertility problems and suffered several setbacks, however in 1992 Dana and Sam were delighted when Dana fell pregnant through IVF treatment. She gave birth to triplets Brandy, Cody and Michael in April of 1993. By the summer of 2001, Dana and Sam had separated and had sought a divorce, with reports suggesting that Sam was a jealous and controlling individual. Upon the separation, Dana moved into a new home in the city. On the 31st of August 2001, Loved ones and neighbours were concerned when they hadn't seen or heard from Dana. As the silence persisted and no communication was received from her, anxiety heightened among those concerned for her well-being. Following her absence from work and unsuccessful attempts by her neighbours to contact her, authorities conducted a welfare check at her residence. Upon arrival, they discovered the back door partially ajar. Upon entering the premises, an officer encountered a distressing scene. Dana was found on the couch, lying face down with one arm contorted behind her back. Upon touching her skin, it was evident that she had passed away several hours earlier. Authorities observed ligature marks around her neck, suggesting asphyxiation. They also found a scarf that they suspected might have been utilised in the crime and additionally they observed dried blood surrounding her nose and ears. 
Following an autopsy, it was revealed that Dana had succumbed to strangulation with such intensity that it had crushed the bones in her neck. Additionally, abrasions on her knees and elbows suggested that she had tried to defend herself until her last breath, with authorities speculating that she may have been strangled while positioned on the carpeted floor, subsequently moved to the couch and then concealed beneath blankets. The time of death was determined to have been in the early hours of August 31st, and her death was determined to have involved foul play. Reports suggested it was a crime of passion, and was committed by an individual who possessed exceptional physical strength. Eyes quickly shifted to Dana's ex-husband, Sam Laskowski. During the investigation, he denied any involvement in the killing of Dana. He informed investigators that on the evening of her death, he had stopped by a gas station before returning home to his children. The next morning, they had all embarked on a camping trip. He presented a gas receipt as evidence to support his whereabouts. Consequently, he was eliminated as a suspect. It came to light that Dana was dating a man called Michael, who resided in Vancouver, Canada. Their relationship was fizzling out, and they were close to breaking up. On the evening of August 30th, Michael and Dana had engaged in a phone call, and Michael told authorities that Dana seemed irritated and refused to reciprocate his words of affection at the end of the call. Having ended the call in such a manner, Michael decided to travel to Washington in the hopes of resolving the issues between them. Unfortunately for Michael, he was stopped at the Canadian border and was refused entry to the country. Records from Border Control confirmed the incident, which ruled Michael out as a suspect in the case. Investigators then turned to Dana's employers, who revealed some disturbing information. A man known as Patrick had installed cable at Dana's new home following her separation from Sam and had been exhibiting some alarming behaviour. Dana had allegedly told her employers that if something bad happened to her, Patrick would be the one responsible. He had been stalking her and harassing her in the month leading up to her death, leaving flowers and letters at her address. Upon questioning Patrick, he claimed that he had been out working and then had gone out with his friends in the evening. His alibi was confirmed by those in his company and, like Michael, was ruled out as a suspect. Investigators were left scratching their heads as leads only took them to dead ends. It was only following Dana's funeral when traction began to pick up once again in the case. Amanda, Dana's 17-year-old niece who was a frequent runaway and someone Dana had welcomed into her home on many occasions, left a disturbing message in the guest book after Dana's funeral. In her entry, she expressed regret to Dana for not being a better niece and acknowledged her newfound sobriety. The way the entry was written stirred up enough suspicion for police that they brought Amanda in for questioning. The teenager recounted spending time with a group of troubled youths in the park. She identified a friend named Blaine, who she believed was physically capable of having killed Dana. She recounted an incident where Blaine allegedly assaulted her on a couch after she rebuffed his advances. Additionally, she remembered observing scratches on Blaine's arms in the aftermath of Dana's murder. Investigators discovered that Blaine had a history of violent offences, including weapons and drugs charges. Their attempts to bring him back to the jurisdiction, however, were unsuccessful. In a strategic move, Law enforcement contacted an individual in prison who was acquainted with Blaine, and shockingly, this person asserted that the perpetrator behind Dana's murder was not Blaine, but rather 18-year-old Emily Suzanne Lowenborg, Amanda's best friend. Those within Amanda's friends group shared the belief that Emily, who was shockingly strong for her size, was the person who had killed Dana. 
Police subsequently requested Emily to join them in an interview at the police station for questioning. She denied having any involvement in the death of Dana, however she failed to provide an alibi during the time frame when Dana was killed. The next step for investigators was to search Emily's residence for evidence. Detectives discovered Emily's diary, which contained a bucket list of things she wished to do before she died. Chillingly, one item on the list read, kill someone and get away with it. Furthermore, they discovered an entry where Emily described a fight she engaged in with Amanda. She stated that she, quote, could strangle her, just like her aunt. Another unsettling twist emerged as it came to light that a black shirt which had belonged to Dana was found on Emily's property and furthermore, Emily had worn that shirt to Dana's funeral service. Despite only possessing circumstantial evidence, police arrested and charged Emily Lauenborg with the murder in March of 2002. Emily eventually told authorities what happened on the 31st of August 2001. Amanda and Emily had consumed drugs before visiting Dana's residence. Emily exhibited disrespectful behaviour as she attempted to have Dana give her money, prompting Dana to request the teenagers to leave. However, the situation escalated dramatically. Dana attempted to gently guide Emily towards the door, but Emily erupted into a fit of rage and assaulted Dana. She placed Dana in a chokehold during a struggle, ultimately using a scarf to strangle her. Amanda claimed that she turned away, as she didn't want to witness the altercation. Amanda stated that the pair took Dana's money before departing from the house. Regarding motive, authorities deciphered that Emily harboured jealousy towards Dana due to the influence Dana held over Amanda, desiring to remove her from Amanda's life. In 2003, Emily initially entered a plea of not guilty to the murder charge. Despite being 17 years old at the time of Dana's death, she was to be tried as an adult. Eventually, Emily changed her plea to guilty for a reduced charge of first-degree manslaughter and received a sentence of six and a half years in prison. Amanda, in exchange for her cooperation, avoided any prison sentence. Media reports stated that Emily had boasted to her friends that she had murdered Dana in a drug-induced blackout, using this to instill fear in people and gain respect from others. Dana had helped Amanda and Emily numerous times, an example of which included leaving a window in her home open so that the teenagers could take refuge and do chores such as laundry. Despite Dana's kindness and sympathy, Emily cruelly stole Dana's life from her. Emily served approximately five and a half years before being released. Despite feeling a sense of relief that some form of justice was achieved, Dana's family expressed disappointment over the relatively short duration of Emily's incarceration for Dana's death. After Emily's release from prison, she underwent a name change, got married and started a family. Dana Laskowski leaves behind a legacy of love, kindness and unwavering devotion to those she cared for. Dana's life was a testament to selflessness and boundless love. Her nurturing spirit shone brightly as she dedicated herself to her loved ones, who continue to deeply feel Dana's absence and will always hold fond memories of her close to their hearts. Thank you.